Hello everybody and welcome back. I am KRX and we are going to be taking a look at Robot Universalis 4. This is going to be a tutorial for complete beginners. And before I monologue too much, let's click on single player here and just get into sort of the uh, the map of the world, right? As, as we're going to be staring at it most of the time. We are playing as a nation in this game and this is the screen at which we can essentially decide what nation we want to play. Um, there's a bunch of different nations that we can click on here and stuff. And I think for this tutorial, we're going to be playing the Ottomans, but you could easily click on Castile or England or Sweden or Lithuania or Novgorod or Muscovy and so on and so forth, right? There are ones down here that I think are recommended for new players, and I agree with these. Um, and then there's some, and then it sort of becomes progressively a little bit more hairy the more you go down here. And if they're not listed on this, then it's going to be uh, presumably a, maybe a little bit too difficult for a new player with no sort of previous understanding of the game or games like this. Um, this game has a lot of interconnected systems. I do want to note that we are playing with the most updated uh, version of the game, the 1.3, included with the uh, the Emperor DLC release. We are playing with Emperor. We are also playing with all the other DLCs. So this is good if you have all the DLCs or you have a big chunk of them and you want to learn about those systems and how they're intertwined with the core systems and stuff. We do also have tutorials on the channel for no DLC playthroughs. We have one for Portugal right now and I hope to make many more. So this is like if you've been really, uh, you're just diving, diving head in, uh, you know, you're just diving in and um, you got all the DLCs when you when you picked up the game or you got a chunk of them, you got a few of them, right? Um, I do think the core game is a fantastic way to learn the game. You do not need the DLCs, but they do change, they fundamentally change how you have to navigate the systems because unfortunately or fortunately depending on how you look at it they do change the game they do change the core gameplay loops and add new things to consider and new decisions to make and new things to balance this is a nation management game that means we're going to be have to be looking at our our internal politics our diplomatic relations to the exterior like our, our neighboring countries right we're going to be having to look at our economy and our trade situation and our technologies and and how we customize our our country's ideologies and how we create their ambitions and and how we work on their missions and stuff like that. So this is, I mean, if you can imagine running a country, right? We've played a lot of games like um, different strategy games where you play as a, a nation, maybe Civilization or Age of Empires or just a city builder or something, right? And this is a different scale, of course, uh, from those games and a different presentation, different mechanical deliverance of, of those concepts. But thematically, this is a game about running a country. In the country that you choose creates a lot of that asymmetry, right? Playing the Ottomans is fundamentally different than playing France, uh, idealistically, uh, religious-wise, uh, geographically, uh, diplomatically. I mean, it's a completely different ecosystem, right? Like, like the Ottomans are directly bordering completely different countries and have completely different strengths and weaknesses than France, right? France has a completely different situation going on. Eventually, the Ottomans and France could sort of collide with each other. They could become relevant to each other. But at the beginning of the game, this is actually a pretty large distance. This is the year 1444. I mean, you know, like like the distance between countries is significant, right? The Ottomans exist over here. India exists over here. But, but fundamentally, India doesn't have any relationships with Europe at the start of the game, right? Like we haven't, there hasn't been that sort of age of colonization. Great Britain hasn't formed. England hasn't, hasn't colonized you know, uh, the the Cape and, and hasn't moved over to India and set up relations with India and, and colonized Indonesia and stuff, right? This hasn't happened yet. Um, the game takes place over 400 years of alternate history where you're guiding a country through those those alternate, those alternate those years of, of, of alternate history, right? Because nothing ever plays out historically. It starts with sort of a loose historical template and then chaos ensues. And we'll see how that happens as we play the game. Um, so we're going to just click on the Ottomans. It gives us a little bit of information about the Ottomans here, but we don't have any context to understanding any of this, right? Um, but we know that we have selected the Ottomans at least, and we'll be able to play as the Ottomans. So we're just going to come down here and hit play. Now, I do recommend playing in Iron Man mode, although just for the purposes of recording and stuff like that, we are going to play in normal mode just so I can save the game and sort of load the game and stuff like that in case something goes awry right, in case something explodes with the recording equipment or something. Um, but for the most part, I do really truly believe, even for a new player, it is okay to use Iron Man mode. What this means is that you're just going to have to live with your consequences, right? It is what it sounds like. It's not as scary as it sounds. It's it's how I typically play the game. Even as someone who's not an expert, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning how to play the game myself. So I like Iron Man mode because it, it has you roll with the punches. It lets you go through the role-playing 
idea of like making a choice and having a consequence, right? There is, there is, a, there's always a consequence to every choice you make in this game. It's actually kind of exciting, but it's also kind of scary, right? And that 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 emotional roller coaster ride that you can go on, ruling a country and making a bad decision and seeing twenty years later that that was a bad decision. That's that's an interesting, powerful experience to to feel in a, playing a video game, right? So we are playing as the Ottomans. And essentially the first thing that we're going to be looking at really is the fact that this is the map, right? This is, this is the game. We're in the game. This is it. We're paused right now because this is a real time strategy game and we can pause the game whenever we want. So unlike like Starcraft or something where we just sort of are always at war with our enemy and we can just sort of, you know, build up our army and, and, and attack the other base, we are currently at peace right now. We are at peace right now. We haven't caused a war. There is no, we're not in a state of war. We are at peace and we have paused the game. We can unpause the game and pause the game as much as we want. We can control the rate of time. But essentially, the real-time aspect of this game is the fact that if we are not paused, time will be continually progressing. We can see in the top right that we're on speed one right now, but the game is paused. We could go up to speed two, three, four, or five. Uh, five is very, very fast and one is very, very slow. So we're probably going to want that around two or three, honestly, to kind of just get going, maybe two. And... Uh, it, you could play as, as fast as you want. You can play at a higher speed, but pause more often or, or play at a lower speed and pause less often. It just depends on how you want to go. I, I don't mean to uh, scare anyone here, but we are not going to be unpausing the game for a while because there's a lot of things that we need to sort of think about in terms of what are we doing? Like, what is our objective? What is our goal? How do we know how to proceed? What do we even, how do we even come to an idea of what we should do and what we should start with? Like, where is that information sort of in the venues and on the screen and how do we answer our own questions about the game. The way we're going to be looking at this playthrough is question answer, right? We are going to be trying to look through it from a new player perspective that doesn't have any context or understanding of the game. Instead of just going through and reading tooltips and just reading off blocks of text, this this means nothing to us. Look at look at how many modifiers are here. Greens, reds, good things, bad things, tons of text, tons of things we don't understand at all, right? This is this entire menu right here, this tooltip, gives us no information as a brand new player. As an experienced player, you know what all this stuff means. But as a new player, you don't know what any of it means. Like, it's it's an interesting contrast, right? So just because this is showing our prestige up here and it's saying it's eight, I like, what does that mean? Like, we could think of, we could try to imagine what it means, assume what it means thematically, and that actually works a lot of the times. We can think about like legitimacy. Oh, we have a lot of legitimacy. That probably means that like our rulership is legitimate and people probably respect the fact that we're legitimate. Like, right, the, the, the peasants and the traders and the people in the actual country probably respect the fact, probably respect our rulership just on the basis that we have a high legitimacy. That makes sense. But then again, we don't really know it's a high legitimacy except for the fact I just kind of assumed. See, I assumed which is bad of me, that you guys knew that 100 legitimacy was actually the highest you could have. You can't go above 100. But there was no reason to know that. So we don't even know that that's a high legitimacy. See, I just actually made a mistake by making that assumption. But the point is, we're not going to go through any of that stuff because we don't have any context for that. We're just looking at the fact, thinking of it, what do we know right now? And we know that we are the Ottomans. We know that we're the Ottomans. There are a big crest up here. Um, there is some things flashing on us. There's different ways that we can look at the screen, right? And and when we're looking at the map, this is it. These are the other countries in the game. These countries are being played by the AI. We picked the Ottomans, but Serbia is going to be played by the computer. Hungary is going to be played by the computer. Poland and so on. These are all of our little neighbors. There's tiny little countries in here. There's big countries over here. There's bigger countries still over here, so on and so forth, right? all different kinds of countries with all different kinds of cultures and ambitions and goals and and all the AI is basically going to try to play each one of them simultaneously to the best of its ability to inhibit our ability to succeed and also just in, in a selfish way, right? All of these countries are going to be playing in a selfish way. That doesn't mean that we can't create diplomatic relations with them. They know that teaming up with us could be a good thing. We might be a powerful nation. They might want to benefit from that, right? So the AI is going to seek to actually uh, make relationship with us as well if they think it'll serve their ultimate goal and ambition. Um, so as the Ottomans here, which is looking at the map, we can sort of see that if we zoom in a lot without really clicking on anything, we can see there's some dudes standing here. Um, so this is sort of a standing army, right? We have, it says here, we have 10,000 infantry, 4,000 of the dudes on the horses. So those are the cavalry, different kinds of units, right? Infantry, cavalry, 
uh, and cannons. We don't have any cannons in that stack. We don't have any cannons here. But we have these these 30, it looks like 30,000 total troops, right? Just in a standing army ready to go if we needed to do something. Then we have some ships here that are sort of in a dock. Very hard to see because it's zoomed down, but that little these little banners just represent our troops. And we can see that other countries have little little stacks of men too. And they have, you know, 3,000 troops and 5,000 troops. I mean, nothing compared to our military might. We are, in fact, a large country. So it makes sense that we have a lot of sort of uh, power and an ability to raise larger army. We have a larger internal population. We have larger manpower. We have a larger sort of uh, ability to uh, to pay for that armory because we have more land that creates more taxation, that creates more production, right? These things just kind of make sense thematically. We haven't actually looked into any of that and the details of any of that, but it makes sense that a larger country that covers more land has is able to use that land to generate military power, economic power, and so on and so forth, right? But what are we thinking right now? Well, we're thinking that uh, we might want to actually sort of see what our diplomatic ecosystem looks like, right? Because we might want to see who we want to potentially, how we want to expand our own country and who we want to ally with and who are our p potential enemies in such of that nature. So one of the things I will sort of look at is that we do have some banners here. And these are just sort of notifying us that, hey, you have some na national decisions available. So we have some decisions we can make at the start of the game. We can hit some buttons if we make if we want to, you know, make some choices basically on, on some trade-offs of things of how we could set sort of the the national agenda, right? We could set the national agenda a little bit. Um, it says we have some truces. So apparently we already have some truces with some countries. So we won't, you know, for the next five years, it looks like there are about five year truces with Poland and Lithuania and Hungary and Latvia and Serbia, so on and so forth, right? These are countries and, and we can see some of these countries here on the map. So we actually have truces with those people, so we can't go to war with them quite yet. Um, that makes sense, and that, and that could be just because of historical reasons or or balance reasons or something like that. But at the start of the game, we start with a truce with some of these countries, so we can't take advantage uh, of those countries right off the bat. Maybe it says that we could we have some free advisor slots, so we could uh, we could hire some more advisors. And if we if we click on these banners, it will take us to a menu where these decisions are present or where these advisor slots are present and stuff like that. But without getting too deep into that, we can see that one of these is like red and it's flashing. It's like, whoa, we have too few rivals. This, this red means that this is like, this is a, a pressing matter. And we can click on that. It opens up actually a diplomacy screen. So that shows that we're on our own diplomacy screen here. We can see our little summary of our ruler right now, who's a 646. And, and these basically are like die rolls, right? Like when you roll a die, you could get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. The thing is you can also get a zero in this as well. So that's not quite exactly like a dice, but basically a six is the highest you can get. So our ruler is actually incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful ruler of our country right now. That's great. Um, but more importantly, it's talking about rivals, right? So it sent us to the screen because this is where we can select different rivals. In fact, wait a second, we've just learned something. Enemies, we have enemies. At the start of the game, we have enemies. And every time you load the game, this will be different. So if you're following along, you might have different enemies. But our enemies in this game are Hungary, Lithuania, Austria, and the Mamluks. They have declared us as the, as rivals, us as their rival. So we might want to rival these people back just because the, you know, fundamentally they won't they won't be our friend. What I can do is I can actually just click anywhere in the Mamlex. It doesn't matter. It brings up a province. I'm going to close the building tab because we don't need that tab sort of sticking out there. And the only thing I'm going to look at here is the fact that they have a crest. And I, I can click on this crest to go to their own diplomacy screen. And from here, I can actually do interactions with them. Like, um, And I'm going to just expand all of these. And some of these are, you know, everything from sort of economic actions to covert actions, like and uh, improve relations and stuff like that, right? So we could just sort of go to, so we have our own diplomacy screen, and then we have, we can go to the, visit the diplomacy screen of all the other countries and actually use this to interact with them. But we could see that the Mamluks have indeed rivaled us, as confirmed by clicking on their diplomacy screen. This means, and then the other thing that I'm noticing, just clicking on them, right? If I just click on any other provinces, I'm seeing a big negative modifier right here below their title, their, their name of their country. Minus 100 because they're a rival. They hate us. This is their opinion of us. They they are, this is, there's a rivalry b between us and they hate us. And this is anywhere between negative 200 and plus 200. So negative 100, I mean, that's that's significant. Like we will never be friends with the Mamluks. Fundamentally, we have learned that this big giant nation down here, the Mamluks, do not like us. They do not like us. They are a rival. They have declared it to the world. They will not ally us. They do not, they are not interested in diplomatic discussion. They are interested in a war and war alone. So you know what? We might have to, and, and they're about our similar size. 
We don't know the exact sort of matchup in terms of how these two countries match up with each other, but the Mamluks, needless to say, look kind of powerful. And that makes sense. Your rivals are going to be other nations that are sort of your equivalents. Like it's not going to, we're not going to be able to rival these tiny little countries because they're not quite uh, as powerful as us. So it makes sense that the Mamluks have already declared us a rival. Maybe we want to rival them too and be like, you know, we don't like you either. You know what I mean? Who knows, right? It just kind of depends. But we can look here. There's a lot of available options here. We could rival Aragon. Aragon, Aragon's like over here. So they haven't actually declared that they hate us, but we could declare that we hate them. Maybe we have ambitions against their territory. Maybe we want to conquer this land. It's a little bit far away, to be honest, right? Aragon's kind of confusing because it stretches out all the way over here. There's some other things going on with our Aragon that we're not quite noticing from the screen, but Aragon might actually be a completely valid um, rival. Um, any of these are completely valid rivals. That's why they're in the list. These are our choices. We could just rival the people that have already rivaled us, though. That might make some sense. Um, anyone that we're maybe potentially hoping to conquer uh, swiftly or, or quickly or go up to war against might be good, like actually Venice here. Venice is kind of an interesting country because they sort of slither around this way. And in fact, actually, the, the way that we can figure that out, right, is let's actually click on our country really quick. And let's actually go to the diplomatic map mode. So down here in the bottom right, there are tons of map modes. And these let you see the world at a glance. The one with the little dove is the diplomatic one. I have this set up a certain way. Um, some of these might be out here presented. Basically, what I'm saying is you might have to right click these and, and add these different map modes because there are hundreds of different maps, literally like maybe not hundreds, but there's tons and tons and tons of different kinds of map modes in this list. But I'm using the diplomatic one and we can click on this to kind of like, this will actually highlight our own country in any diplomatic relations we have. In fact, wait a second, there's a little bit of purple right here. So we can hover over this, we can see that Ragusa, um, this is Ragusa. Why is it purple? We are guaranteeing their independence. So it's purple to, to signify that we have a diplomatic relation with these guys. We're guaranteeing the independence of Ragusa to protect them from uh, the Catholic heathens, I guess, you know what I mean? Uh, maybe they, I think Ragusa is Catholic, to be honest, but but we're just making sure that they don't get conquered by any of these other, other nations. So at the start of the game, the Ottomans are guaranteeing the independence of Ragusa, and that's a diplomatic action. Maybe we want to save Ragusa for ourselves. Um, you know, who knows? You, you could look at this in all kinds of sneaky ways, why one country might want to guarantee the independence of another. That means that if someone declares war on Ragusa, we're declaring to the world that we will defend them in war, even though we technically don't have like an actual like alliance together. We could build an alliance if we wanted to. Maybe we could even diplomatically vassalize them. There's a lot of different, like if you can kind of imagine, we could maybe pull them under our wing a little bit, take them under our wing. But if we click this again, I have it set up to go to the opinion map mode, okay? And with the opinion map mode, we can actually see kind of, it, it, red is people that don't like us and, and green is people that do like us. Um, although, you know, even just a yellow usually pro pro probably means they're kind of positive towards us or kind of a, kind of a neutral towards us. Whereas the red, the darker orange and the red is, is like, these are the people that have rivaled us, right? These are our enemies here. We can see them in this map mode, in the opinion map mode. Clicking on ourselves. We can click on the Mamluks and see that, oh, okay, they have a rival too. Um, this country over here has rivaled the Mamluks and they can see some countries that really like them and, and so on and so forth. So Aragon doesn't really actually hate us that much, even though we could rival Aragon if we, if we wanted to kind of go west, right? If we wanted to go west, we might go... And, and sort of island hop across the Mediterranean here and, and want to be rivaled with Aragon. But you know what? I think the simplest thing to do is be like, hey, these guys have rivaled us. Let's look and see uh, what, are, what are our opportunities. We might have an opportunity against the Mamluks eventually. Mamluks are a big, strong, uh, bordering nation. We might want to rival them. We might want to rival um, Hungary. Hungary is pretty close. So there might be a situation there. So maybe we rival Hungary. And, and the thing is, what I wanted to do by looking at that uh, diplomatic mode is, is by clicking on Venice, right? It says that we can rival Venice. So let's go find Venice. Why is it saying we can rival Venice? Well, Venice is a, seems to be a little bit farther away, but it's a little deceptive, right? Because Venice actually highlights all of these different little provinces. They kind of control all through the Venetian Sea. They kind of control a bunch of provinces sort of disconnected, right? Non-contiguous land. They own Corfu down here. They own this province over here. They own Crete. They own all kinds of little pieces of land down here. In fact, this is even teal for them. This is a vassal. This is a this is a Venice Venetian vassal here. And there, it also looks like they're protecting the, the independence of, um, they're guaranteeing the independence of the knights. So the Venice has their fingers all over this region here, which of course, as you can see, this is clearly our region, right? We clearly are owed 
this land. It is our destiny to unify this, this area, unify Turkey and unify Greece under the Ottoman Empire. So actually, the Venice actually kind of looks like Venice might be somewhere we want to bump up against. You know what I mean? And they don't look too particularly powerful, but if we could beat them up, that could be a good thing, right? Because essentially what being a rival with someone does is not only does it just sort of per proclaim to the world that, hey, we don't like each other and that's okay. And it tells everybody else diplomatically like, hey, I don't like that guy. So if you want to be my rival, you better not be friends with him. You know, this kind of creates the, the diplomatic battle lines, right? The, the whose side are you on, you know what I mean, kind of situation here. So by getting rivals though... Um, we're also going to be able to create conflict with these countries more easily, right? Because like I said, we're in a state of peace. We're in a state of peace at the start of the game. We have to create a justification to go to war. We can't just go to war willy-nilly with countries. It, it would ruin our legitimacy. It would ruin our stability. It would ruin our people's trust in us, right? The actual citizens that, that, that live in this country, they'd be like, why the heck are you just, just a big war? You know, I'm saying our own stability would suffer, but also our diplomatic relationships, our diplomatic potential in the larger ecosystem of the world would also suffer because everyone, our own people and people abroad, would just see us as a warmonger, right? So there is a, there's a balance to going to war and and we need a reason to go to war if we can prove to people hey we have a reason we need to go to war because of this this and this we have reasons we have land that's rightfully ours or we have a trade conflict or or we have uh they've insulted us or something right or they're a rival we just want to go and humiliate a rival and it'll be good for our own uh, nationalism and stuff right like like we need to create our own thematic justification and and literal Little just as a player, we're going to be creating our own thematic justification for war. But as an, a nation, a mechanical nation in the game, we need to create an actual reason to go to war so that when we go, it's called a casus belli, a cause for war. So, and to build those causes, that cause for war, to build that up, to, to fabricate that basically in certain situations, right? We actually need to uh, to work on that and and to create the uh, the situations where we can actually build up a, a reason to go to war and being a rival with someone what i wanted to say was being a rival with someone makes that easier so if we can rival the people that we ultimately want to go to war with and and maybe expand our country by taking some of their land then being a rival is actually going to make that easier in some ways so having venice as a rival means hey yeah they know we're coming for them and that's going to send out a diplomatic warning to everybody that may or may not want to choose a side in that but um, it also lets us better create a justification for taking these pieces of land in the future, right? And in, in actually starting wars and starting skirmishes with Venice. So Venice is going to be someone that we want to go to war with. We're probably eventually going to want to go with to war with Hungary, but they're kind of buffered right now by Wallachia and Serbia. And we might want to eventually go to war with Lithuania, but they're kind of buffered by other countries right now. They're not quite they're not quite on our doorstep. Even Mamluks are kind of like buffered a little bit, right? So. But these are the these are the countries we had to had to choose from, and I think I think uh, Venice is going to be is going to be a good one to uh, to rival here. So, but really, what we want to do is now that we've got a rival situation, we actually probably want to think of some alliances, right? And we can just click on countries, right? Karaman, uh, they're hostile; they don't like us. And I'm just clicking on countries and just trying to see what do they think? Do they like us? Are they friendly? Do they have a positive relation of us? So here's a country that's that's friendly towards us. But they're kind of small. It's like, is that is that the best we can do? So we could just sort of go through and we can click on countries. Okay, this country's a little bit beefier. They like us. In fact, they're feeling threatened towards us. So they probably would definitely like an alliance with us because otherwise they're kind of feeling on edge. We could keep clicking on countries and 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 these guys actually are friendly towards us, but they have a large negative modifier. Um, and that's because we're actually a different religion than this country here. So that could actually create a little bit of tension between our two countries. We might not want to ally someone where there's that sort of inherent tension brewing. In fact, we can actually, that we learned religion, right? Just clicking on this and looking at this heretic religion. That's interesting. So we've now learned that religion plays into diplomacy. It, it, it can create tension between countries. In fact, hey, look, there's a religious map mode. We can go to the religious map mode. We can see how the world is broken up, right? Lots of sort of Islam nations here, different kinds of Islam, the Shia and the Sunni. Uh, we have Coptic down here. We have Catholic, Orthodox. In fact, we got a lot of uh, sort of wavy lines through here, right? And what that means is that these are these are our country. This is this is our country here. These wavy lines mean that there's actual cultural ununity in these in these particular provinces within our own country. So we've learned that something about our internal situation here is that we are a Sunni nation, right? This is Sunni. It's nice and bright green. 
This is all orthodox land. This is orthodox land that is in our Sunni nation. So there's a little bit of tension within our own country because we're not fully unified religiously amongst all of our people. We have a, a significant chunk of our population is orthodox. And, and that, uh, but it's interesting because the Ottomans are kind of special because they're kind of set up to be able to balance that, that sort of non-unity between those cultures and those religions. But it's just interesting because we were able to figure that out by just looking at QQ. Uh, I, I call this country QQ just because of the, the name there. Um, but we looked at this country here. We saw that there's, you know, religion plays into diplomacy. And we can click on countries here and we could try to find some. In fact, the Mamluks are, the Mamluks are totally uh, a Sunni. But uh, they don't really, but they just don't like it. In fact, there's a positive modifier here. We can see that there's different modifiers here for um, for religion. There's actually, like, despite all the reasons why they hate us, there's actually a few reasons why they like us. And, and one of the reasons they do like us is because of our, our religion. We can look for, oh, Tunis really likes us, right? We're finding other sort of North African Sunnis here. And we can see that these nations actually really quite like us. So Tunis likes us. That's kind of interesting. I don't know if we could use that to our advantage. I don't know if Tunis is in a strategic position for us. They're a little far away. It kind of depends on whether or not they'd be able to help us or not. So basically what I'm trying to do is literally just move. And because we know that all of these guys are Catholic, it's probably not going to be likely that we're going to be able to out. Yeah, these guys are just, they just, they just don't like us, right? They, Hungary's rivaled us, Bosnia. These are, these are nations. In fact, actually, wait a second, you know, this nation right here actually does actually has a friendly attitude. Maybe out of fear, they have a friendly attitude towards us, but there is a different religion that creates a, a tension and uh, it just makes it harder to get the relationship with the alliance. But they will definitely ally us. And if we click, right, if we just click on, if we just sort of click on the country, and then we go to their diplomacy, and we can see offer alliance right here in the alliance actions. Easy. We can we can offer an alliance. And this little check mark means they'll accept. They won't accept vassalization. It's grayed out, so we can't even click it. We haven't met the conditions to click this. But even if we did, they still wouldn't accept it for certain reasons. For certain reasons. But the offer alliance, they will accept. In fact, there's 75 reasons why they'll say yes, and only 13 reasons they'll say no. Not the same religious group is one of the reasons they'll say no. They also have a negative opinion. Their actual opinion is negative, even though they have a friendly attitude. So they will say no for those reasons, but it doesn't matter because overwhelmingly, they have a friendly attitude. Negative opinion, but friendly attitude. We have a very powerful army, and they like that. They want to ally us because we have a really powerful army. That makes sense, right? And then uh, the Ottomans have a good diplomatic relation, a uh, reputation. Sorry, our, rep our diplomatic reputation is good. We have a good reputation. People trust us. People that have dealings with us the before, there's good, good positive vibes going out about the Ottomans and, and their ability to honor alliances and, and things like that. So we have a good diplomatic reputation. We haven't done anything to, to ruin our diplomatic reputation. Therefore, it sort of defaults to being a good benefit of the doubt system. And we get a little bit of a bonus modifier for that. But so these guys would ally us. But the thing is, I don't know if we really need these guys as an ally because they're kind of vulnerable and they're kind of a little bit further away. And they're also very, they're not, they just don't look like they're going to be significant, right? We might want to ally these guys though, because these guys look a little bit chunkier. They do have a different religion, right? Now, here's the thing. These guys have such a negative modifier of us that they will not offer the alliance. It's it's too negative. It's a minus 1,000, right? We need to get it to some... We need to get them up high enough to like a minimum um, amount of sort of positive opinion that they'll... Or, or less negative. Like, they're, they're very much a huge negative modifier here, right? So, so we're going to want to try to boost that up a little bit from negative 45 to closer to zero. But they do have the friendly attitude, so they are looking to potentially get in alliance with us. What we could do, actually, wait a second, we get a royal marriage. And a royal marriage will kind of sure up that, that di diplomatic slot, right? If we can at least get a royal marriage, that could, that could pave the way to an alliance, right? That'll increase their opinion of us if we have a royal marriage. So actually, one of the first things we might do is if we want to ally these guys, which I'm just kind of like just thinking based on the size of the countries here and the fact that there's a little bit of space between us and them, right? They are a different religion. I don't really like that too much, but but there you go. You know, eventually we'll want to spread our own religion over this area. So these guys are going to be competing with us idealistically, but at least for now, I think we'll have common goals to kind of beat up on these smaller nations in between us. So I think right now we're going to have common goals. So we could use the royal marriage. We can, there we go. They will accept. Yes, they will accept for those reasons. 
There we go. We got a royal marriage. And now that we have the royal marriage, they'll actually accept an, an alliance offer. And you can see that that royal marriage is, is already making a difference on their relationship. And we can continue to improve our relationship with them, which is what we'll want to do by sending a diplomat to improve relations. In fact, this is interesting, right? Because we just learned we cannot, we already recently sent a diplomat, so we cannot send another diplomat. There we go. We've learned that we have diplomats. And up here, we could see a, a sort of a, a summary of our traders. We have zero out of two available, but we have two. We have no colonists, zero out of zero. Two out of three diplomats available, and one out of one missionary available. So that's what these tabs are up here, right? Just to remind us what we have. Over here in this tab, we can see our diplomats. We have two that are free. They're being lazy. We don't want lazy diplomats. We can see now, we didn't know this exactly, but we could see that by sending that royal marriage request, it actually uses a diplomat, and that diplomat now needs to come back. Now it needs to sort of head back home, and it'll take 15 days for them to get back home. So they're tied up for the next 15 days. That's okay, but let's use our other diplomats to potentially do other things. Like maybe we want to improve relations with another country. We have the Great Horde over here. We might want to ally them for reasons. Uh, we have no guy, right? There's a bunch of different countries here. We could uh, we could try to look at maybe the Tim ally the Timrids. And just try to look for bigger countries, right? Because we're a big country, so we deserve big country alliances. Here's the interesting thing. Poland doesn't hate us, right? Poland's a big country. They don't hate us. We're definitely they definitely don't like us, right? They don't, they're just neutral. It would be kind of interesting to actually butter up Poland. Now, this probably won't be a long-term relationship. But it would be kind of interesting to think that maybe we, by, by being friendly with Poland, we can sort of slow down the European um, sort of propaganda against us a little bit in terms of the fact that most of these Europeans are going to be unified against us. By us actually having a favorable opinion of Poland, we might actually be able to thematically slow them down, slow down the Europeans' uh, unity against us and allow us to actually sort of dissect the European alliance network a little bit easier by keeping Poland out of it. So actually improving relations with Poland might just be kind of a fun thematic thing to do. Do we really like the Poles? No. Do they really like us? No. But by sort of trying to work and, and make an effort at actually being their friend, this might actually sort of give us some interesting opportunities in the future. And you can see that there we go. We've tied up one of our diplomats to improve relations. Right now we're at negative 24, but every month it'll be improved by four. So every month, there, this number right here will just slowly be increasing. The longer we leave this diplomat here, up to a maximum of 100 relations added with that modifier, right? It says improve relations plus four. So we can get that up to a plus 100. So in total, that would round it out to about a 75, right? Um, it wouldn't get us all the way up to literally a plus 100. It's just that modifier itself, and then all the modifiers to add together for the for the total sum, right? We can get this up to like 200 if we combine alliance with royal marriage and, and, you know, improve relations and all the different actions that we can do to butter someone up to make them happy, right? But, but, but that one action, the action of improving relations will only get us up to plus 100, which is why we'll never be able to make the Mamluks like us. The Mamluks will never ever like us because even if we improve relations with them, it'll still be negative. It'll be distinctly negative. So there's no point even trying to make the Mamluks like us. They just hate us. We hate them. That's fine. I'm totally cool with that. So we have one more diplomat. And here's the interesting thing is diplomats can be used as spies. So there are espionage actions. So we could actually look at some of these countries that we actually want to conquer. And one very, very, very thematic and important uh, province for the Ottoman Empire is Constantinople. Like we want this. This is in the center of our country. We want this province. We could go to their di diplomatic screen and we could see that, oh, wait, whoa, they have all these stripy bits. These basically mean that Byzantium, Byzantium, the nation of Byzantium thinks they rightfully own this stuff, that they, they are right, they are owed this land. These are, these are core provinces of the Byzantium Empire. So they want to retake this stuff from us, but we don't want them to have that, of course, and they're very weak. So I don't think we're going to let them do that. Um, but that's just really interesting to be able to go to their screen and see that they actually already have sort of a claim uh, on these on these provinces uh, due to historical reasons and, and things like that. But we can also see this is actually a dark green over here or, or green over here, right? So Byzantium actually extends here and here. So they control these provinces over here and they control Constantinople. But we really want Constantinople because it's a major throughway in our country. And it's a very rich province. We haven't talked about that. And it also makes sense, right? If you know uh, the history of Constantinople, right? A center of the, the, the meeting of East and West, right? Like this is a very influential province. It's very rich. It's, tr it's a trade center. It's all kinds of things that we know just even understanding 
uh, the name of Constantinople, right? And it's, it's place historically um, and ge geographically. So we want this land, um, but we need to create a reason to take this land. So we're going to use our diplomat to actually, as a spy, as, an, as espionage, we're in the Byzantium screen right here, we're going to build a spy network. And as we build this spy network, every month we'll slowly be building up a spy network. And one of the important things that we're going to want to use this spy network on is once it gets to 20 and it builds at about one and a half per month, once we get to 20, we'll be able to fabricate a claim on Byzantium. And when we can fabricate a claim, we can fabricate a claim on Constantinople and tell everybody, hey, look, this is rightfully ours. This is rightfully ours. And we can set the, the, the groundwork for war against Byzantium. We can set the groundwork for war against Byzantium. And that's what we're going to be doing with our third diplomat. We have one diplomat buttering up Poland, making them happy, um, just buffering the European sort of potential European alliance network by making Poland uh, sort of a friend of ours. We are trying to ally QQ over here. And we did that by sending a, a royal marriage request. And then we'll also go back and follow that up with an alliance request. And we are building a spy network in Byzantium to eventually sort of mark um, uh, mark our next sort of um, conquest, our, our, our future goals, right? Announce to the world where we want to go and how we're going to do it and why it's justified to do so. But thanks everybody for hanging out, guys. We haven't even unpaused the game. We've looked at our geography, right? We've looked at sort of how we can sort of evaluate some of the diplomatic elements of the game. We've thought about the world in terms of from our Ottoman perspective. And we will be back in the next episode. We're going to look at our internal situation. How's our economy going? Is our military big enough? Can we make a bigger military? What are our missions? What are the actual, like there are actually different things in the game that will help guide us further in the game and give us ideas on what we should do. And we can actually be looking into all of our internal situation because right now we've been looking at our external, which is very important. Every time you play a country, you're going to want to look around at your ecosystem. You're going to want to look and see who's the, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Who's the guys that want to kill us? And who are the guys that we want to kill? And who are we want to, going to want to team up with, right? That's that's part of this game is is digesting that local ecosystem. And that's what we've done. We know we have a lot of Catholic Europeans up here that don't like us. We know that we have some big rivals in the, in the region. We know that we have some friendly Sunni uh, Islam nations over here, and we can butter some of them up. But we also know that we're going to want to conquer some of these guys too because um, they're much more, they look small and weak, and, and it looks like an opportunity for expansion and unifying of, of Turkey, right? So we're going to want to do that as well. So we've sort of just looked at the ecosystem around our country and tried to dissect um, what we can do with it diplomatically and also aggressively and, and defensively as well. So thanks everybody for watching. I will see you guys in the next episode where we'll take a look at the internal situation of the Ottomans um, at the start of the game in the year 1444. Thank you everybody. I'll see you guys in the next one.